Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about the basic structures and terminology to understand skeletal muscle physiology. So when you're first taking a look at skeletal muscle physiology, it's important to go back and take a look at the anatomy of skeletal musculature. So what you're looking at right now is what we would call a muscle cell or a muscle fiber. So inside of your skeletal muscle organs are going to be uh, an abundance of skeletal muscle cells. The skeletal muscle cells are surrounded by a sarcolemma, um, and that sarcolemma will have these uh, invagination structures uh, that are called T-tubules. And T-tubules are important because they're going to bring the electrical signaling down inside uh, the muscle cell so that muscle contraction can actually be uh, initiated. In order for an electrical signal to reach the sarcolemma, uh, you would need to have connections, which are not demonstrated on this diagram, but let's say that this is a somatic motor neuron. This would be a connection using an axon terminal uh, to actually release neurotransmitter to stimulate the sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle cell. So the action potential signal would move down the somatic motor neuron, triggering a release of acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, and that acetylcholine would bind to receptors that are found in the sarcolemma. And so the action potential signal then can continue along the sarcolemma and can move down inside the T-tubules. So it's important to understand that there's a nervous system connection to your muscle cells. Um, inside the muscle cells, uh, you're going to find lots of myofibril structures. And those myofibril structures are actually the contractile structure uh, within the muscle cell. So if you were to take a look at the myofibril, you'll notice a structure called the sarcomere. And the sarcomere is delineated by Z-disc or Z-line to Z-line. So from one Z-line to the next, represents one sarcomere. And there's a banding pattern to the sarcomere. We have I bands, we have the A band, and then of course we have the H zone, uh, which is the banding structure to the sarcomere. So sarcomeres are basically just the protein arrangement within the myofibril. It's the arrangement predominantly of actin and myosin that gives you the sarcomere structure and it's these proteins that are going to be involved in muscle contraction. So a muscle cell will have many myofibrils in it made up of sarcomeres in order for contraction to take place. Some other structures to make note of, uh, you'll see mitochondria within muscle cells. Uh, that's really important for producing ATP, which is necessary for uh, muscle function, muscle contraction, uh, and then you'll also see uh, sarcoplasmic reticulums, and those are important for storing calcium, which is very important to uh, skeletal muscle physiology. And so as you get into uh, muscle physiology, it's important to understand these anatomical structures so that you can make sense out of what's taking place. Some other terminology uh, to consider as we go through muscle physiology um, is just to talk about uh, terms like muscle tension and load and contraction and relaxation. And so what do all of these things represent? So the contraction of muscle fibers, uh, in essence, creates force. Uh, and we create force in order to move or resist a load uh, that's placed on uh, the body. Muscle tension is another way to describe force within the contracting uh, muscle. So muscle tension in terms of muscle physiology is the force created by a contracting muscle. The load represents the weight or a force that opposes the contraction of your musculature. Contraction is the creation of tension uh, in a muscle, which is, of course, an active process, uh, and it requires ATP. Relaxation is the release of tension 
uh, that was created by uh, the contraction in the skeletal musculature. And so if you understand some of the basic terminology, then you can understand what's taking place in skeletal muscle physiology. So what are some of the uh, sort of general functionality of skeletal muscle contraction? So if we were to just summarize um, the basics of skeletal muscle contraction, uh, the first thing we would look at is the events at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, and so that again is somatic motor neurons. So here we have uh, our axon terminal again. This is somatic motor neurons making a connection, a neuromuscular junction with the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. So this is the muscle cell or muscle fiber. And so here we have the sarcolemma and then here we have the T-tubule structure. And so in the neuromuscular junction, we're looking at acetylcholine being released from the somatic motor neurons in order to activate receptors on the sarcolemma of the muscle cell in order to create electrical signals, action potential signals, that can go down the T-tubules uh, and begin uh, to initiate contraction. The second part, when we look at muscle physiology, is excitation contraction coupling. <clears throat> These are the events that are going to be taking place in order to release calcium within the muscle cell so that uh, the contraction uh, cycle can be initiated. So muscle uh, action potentials uh, that have come down the T-tubule are going to trigger the release of calcium, which will activate the contraction relaxation cycle. And so we call that excitation, the nervous system, linking together, coupling the contraction of uh, the skeletal muscle. The contraction relaxation cycle is going to occur once the calcium signal has been released. So during the excitation contraction uh, coupling process, there's a release of calcium, and that calcium is going to trigger the muscle contraction that takes place. So what we're talking about in the contraction relaxation cycle is really the uh, molecular events that are taking place uh, predominantly through what's called the sliding filament mechanism. So the sliding filament mechanism of contraction is ultimately the interactions of actin and myosin within the sarcomere of the myofibril that's initially going to uh, give us muscle contraction. If it's a single muscle contraction, uh, we would refer to it as a muscle twitch. If you add muscle twitches together, if we could summate muscle twitches together, we could get a full uh, tetanus contraction of your skeletal muscle. So you could actually reach uh, tetanus in the muscle, and uh, a tetanus contraction is a steady, sustained muscle contraction. So these are the main events <clears throat> that we look at when we talk about skeletal muscle physiology. Neuromuscular junction, <clears throat> excitation contraction coupling, and the contraction relaxation cycle. So what's going on with actin and myosin, and, and what are some of these uh, features that we see in uh, the skeletal muscle anatomy that's going to lead to the physiology? So let's take a little bit closer look at the sarcomere structure and the organization of the sarcomere. So when muscles move a load, they shorten. And so back in the 1950s, there were physiologists uh, known as Andrew Huxley and Rolf Niedergerke, uh, and they discovered through experimentation that the A band of the sarcomere was constant. So if this protein from here to here represents the A band, um, what, what Huxley and Niedergerke noticed is that the A-band protein uh, was constant during muscle contraction, meaning it wasn't shortening. But if muscles shorten during contraction, they, they hypothesized what was actually taking place. 
So since the A band is not shortening and the A band represents the myosin protein, there must be some other protein that is shortening in this process. So the A band, uh, because it represents myosin, the shortening of myosin is not what is causing muscle contraction. Thus, there had to be some sort of sliding filament mechanism uh, in order for contraction to take place. So if you look at this model, what you notice is that the actin protein, so the actins represented in red on this diagram, there's an overlap between the actin and the myosin. So we have an overlap. And you can actually see that if you cut this section in cross section, Okay, so we're sectioning uh, where the sarcomere overlaps. You'll notice that there are red proteins and blue proteins that are overlapping each other. And so this is the actin and myosin overlap that is actually going to allow for the sliding filament mechanism uh, to take place. So in this sliding filament model, the overlapping actin and myosin uh, would be the result of muscle contraction. So the actin protein can actually move over the top of the uh, myosin protein and they can come towards each other and cause the sarcomere to shorten. And sarcomere shortening is going to lead to myofibril shortening which is going to lead to muscle cell shortening and thus the organ shortening. So in a resting myofibril, when you notice the zone of overlap within the sarcomere, you are going to better understand that that is the mechanism uh, for contraction. So let's take a look at the sarcomere and what's happening during contraction. So during contraction, the actin slides over the myosin Thus, the Z lines or Z discs must be moving closer together. So if this is the relaxed state of the sarcomere and this is the contracted state of the sarcomere, notice that here we have Z line and Z line and now they're much closer together. So the sarcomere has shortened. But you'll notice that the A band, so here's the A band right here, this is the myosin protein. The myosin protein has not shortened because here it is again. Here's the A band. That's the myosin and it hasn't shortened. You'll also notice <coughs> that there's an I band in this structure. You'll also notice that there's an H zone in this structure. The A band remains constant, but the I bands and the H zones get shorter. And they shorten because the actin protein, so the actin protein, is sliding over the myosin. So you can see the zone of overlap in the first diagram. And now you can see the zone of overlap in the second diagram. And you can see that the actin now overlaps more of the myosin. And you see that on both sides. So therefore, they have slid over the top of each other. So the actin proteins are sliding over the myosin. So I bands and H zones shorten, the A band remains constant, and the Z lines are getting closer together because the actin filaments are sliding over the myosin and they're moving towards the middle of the sarcomere. The middle of the sarcomere is the M line. So in sliding filament mechanism, we're basically saying that the actin is sliding over the myosin and it's moving towards the M line. So this, mo this model that was proposed basically explains how you can create force or tension uh, within the muscle. It also, though, explains how you can create force or tension without actually having movement take place. So you can have tension within, so tension is force. You can have tension within a muscle and not necessarily have movement of the muscle. It all depends on the number of 
sarcomeres moving within the muscle cells. So how many myofibrils are contracting will dictate essentially how much force you're generating within the skeletal muscle cell and therefore dictate how much force the muscle is actually generating. So tension in essence in muscle is proportional to the number of myosin and actin interactions within the myofibrils and thus within the muscle cell. So if you increase the interactions, you can increase, so if we increase the interactions between actin and myosin, we can increase the amount of tension or the amount of force that's being generated. And in order to have movement, you're going to have to generate more force within uh, the organ. If you're not having movement, if you just have slight tension that we see, uh, what we might call muscle tone, and muscle tone um, actually gives us uh, posture. So to be able to sit in a chair or to stand upright, you have postural maintenance. That only requires slight amounts of uh, force or slight amounts of tension just so you can maintain the tone and position of the musculature, but not necessarily movement of the muscle. So that's an interesting concept when you look at sliding filament mechanism. So how does this movement actually take place? The movement of myosin um, uh, and actin, the interactions between them, uh, is actually what creates the force within the skeletal muscle cells. So you actually have to have the movement of what are called cross bridges that come from the uh, myosin structure. So what is a cross bridge? So in this diagram, this is the myosin uh, protein, <clears throat> this is the uh, actin protein, and there's some other proteins to take a look at. We'll also be looking at troponin and tropomyosin. <clears throat> but the cross bridge structure is this extension of the myosin. <clears throat> so movement of myosin cross bridges when these head-like structures move, so these myosin heads, when these myosin heads are able to bind onto actin and move, that's going to create uh, contractile force within uh, the myofibril. So it's the movement of the myosin cross bridges that actually provides the force to move actin and cause it to slide uh, within the sarcomere structure. How is that going to take place? Well, myosin heads are only able to bind uh, with actin when a calcium signal is available. The calcium signal is what's going to initiate the movement of the cross bridge, so it's going to create what we call a power stroke movement so that the myosin can pull the actin towards the center of the sarcomere, or the myosin can cause the uh, actin protein to slide and move towards the M line of the sarcomere. So myosin heads are able to move when calcium is available. So part of understanding skeletal muscle physiology is figuring out how calcium gets released uh, within muscle cells in order to trigger uh, muscle contraction. Myosin heads are able to bind to actin. So a myosin head is able to bind to actin when there's available calcium. So in this first scenario, you have the cross bridge attempting to bind to the actin, but it's actually not able to bind because there's a blocking protein in place. The blocking protein is called tropomyosin, and it prevents the cross bridge from creating high force bonds with the actin in order to have a binding that will lead to muscle contraction. Troponin is going to assist in the moving of tropomyosin when calcium is available. So if calcium 
combined with troponin, you'll actually see the movement of tropomyosin. So tropomyosin can shift out of the way so that the cross bridge can actually have binding to the actin. So now we actually see a physical connection uh, with the cross bridge to actin, and that will lead to muscle contraction. Um, when you want to relax muscle, the myosin heads will have to release from the actin and then reset in order to have um, a contractile cycle. And we'll look at that cycle uh, in future videos. So during contraction, myosin heads <coughs> do not necessarily all release at the same time because then your muscle would snap back to uh, a resting position. So myosin heads will bind to actin and then they will release while other uh, myosin heads bind if you want to sustain a muscle contraction position. Uh, this is what we call asynchronous uh, binding and release uh, from the actin to sustain muscle contractions. So how does the myosin head actually work? What's going on? Well, the myosin head has ATPase activity. In essence, myosin uh, heads are able to convert ATP into mechanical energy. So you may have noticed that on the cross bridge, on the myosin head, there's ADP and inorganic phosphate. This is energy that's in the potential energy state uh, that's able to assist in muscle contraction. So myosin can, uh, myosin heads, because they have ATPase activity, they're essentially an enzyme. Um, they're able to convert the ATP into mechanical energy that's going to be necessary for um, uh, muscle uh, contraction because of the cross bridge motion. So it takes the ATP and it converts it into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That ATP hydrolysis is actually what's able to reset the myosin head and have it in a potential energy state so that uh, myosin cross bridge can interact with actin. So when myosin is able to bind to actin, you can actually release, notice in this diagram, you can release that energy, which actually is now going to allow for the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, oops, kinetic energy, okay? the energy of motion, we're able to move the myosin head and therefore have a power stroke uh, that allows for the sliding filament mechanism to take place. When you have fresh ATP that binds, so when a new ATP comes in and binds to the cross bridge, that's actually what allows the cross bridge to release from the actin, uh, and you can then start the cycle over again. So we'll be looking more at how this all fits together in the contraction relaxation cycle. But I want you to understand that the myosin head has ATPase activity, so it can take ATP, it can break it down into ADP and inorganic phosphate, and store up poten potential energy, and then that energy can be released in the form of kinetic energy so that the sliding filament mechanism can take place. What's going on with the calcium? I've kind of already talked about it a little bit, but the interaction of calcium <coughs> with troponin, so when calcium is able to interact with troponin, that's going to be the trigger that's going to allow for muscle contraction to take place. So calcium combined with the protein troponin, that will ultimately move tropomyosin out of the way. So this protein, notice that tropomyosin is in this position where it's blocking and not allowing binding. And then here we see that the tropomyosin has moved in this other diagram. When calcium binds troponin and moves tropomyosin out of the way, you're able to have a binding of myosin to actin. So troponin is literally attached to tropomyosin and it controls its position. So the initiation of contraction basically looks like this. Calcium binds troponin, 
the calcium troponin complex is going to move tropomyosin out of the way, exposing a binding site. Myosin heads are able to bind to the actin so that you have uh, this interaction between myosin and actin. Myosin has this stored up potential energy that then you can release that energy in the form of a power stroke. That power stroke moves the myosin head, therefore pushing the actin, sliding the actin. And so as actin slides over the myosin, you have a contraction cycle. And as long as you have calcium available, as long as there's calcium available, and as long as you can continue to make ATP within the muscle, you can continue this cycle of binding, power stroke, release, and reset of the myosin head, and that'll keep muscle contraction going. If muscle is going to relax, then calcium has to be put away. So calcium levels have to go down in the cytosol in order for muscle to relax. So cytosolic calcium is actually pumped back into your sarcoplasmic reticulums. So sarcoplasmic reticulums store <clears throat> calcium. So there's actually ATP consumption when you run calcium pumps uh, in the sarcoplasmic reticulums to put calcium back into uh, those sarcoplasmic reticulums so that you can uh, stop muscle contraction. So cytoplasmic calcium uh, basically gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulums uh, using a calcium ATPase pump. As the mass balance of calcium shifts, calcium is going to release from troponin, tropomyosin is going to slide back into its blocking position, so myosin can't bind with actin. And so cross bridges uh, that release are therefore going to allow the sarcomere uh, to go back to its resting position. Sarcomeres can return to their resting position because there is elasticity uh, in the myofibrils. And that elasticity is aided by the protein titan. So that's this green protein in this diagram. Titan proteins and, and also elastic connective tissues within the muscle itself is going to allow sarcomeres uh, to essentially release. And so you're going to see sliding of the actin away from the inline, and you're going to go back to the resting position of the sarcomere. So that's an introduction to skeletal muscle uh, physiology. And we'll be talking more about neuromuscular junctions and excit excitation contraction coupling and sliding filament theory uh, in future videos. I hope that helps. Take care.